M0 NTV and welcome back to my shack and to another homebrew video. So soon. <laughs> it's like waiting for a bus, isn't it? You know, you wait for ages and nothing comes and then two come at once. Well, yeah, this one is coming very quickly, I know, on the back of the last one. Um, but I'm quite excited because I've actually started work on this dual band 15 10 meter rig. And um, so I'm keen to kind of get going with that. So it's going to be a very practical video and we're going to dive right in and build and test and tweak the bandpass filter. Well, there's going to be two. We're just going to build one today, the one for 15 metres, but there will be obviously another one for 10 metres, and they will ultimately be auto-switching, I hope. So in other words, when you change the uh, frequency on the, uh, on the tuning dial, um, the appropriate filter will just click into place. Uh, we'll cover all of that, all of the switching, in the next video okay but today I just want to concentrate on the on the building of uh, of the bandpass filter and I'm going to show you exactly how I do it uh, and I did a video a little while ago on the dark art of the bandpass filter but I neglected to do one really important thing which I've remedied this time which is it's not even just about designing it or building it it's about setting it up because you can build a great filter but if you don't know how to set it up and, and get the right filter shape get it, um, uh, the bandwidth, the, the appropriate bandwidth in the place that you want it, you know. Um, so I'm going to show you all of this. And uh, so I hope uh, that you find some, uh, some useful uh, information here and uh, hope that you enjoy. Well, this is the design from Hans Summers' website, QRP Labs, and I'll put the, uh, the link uh, in the description. And uh, you can download this freely. And this is the basic design here. And as you'll see, so it's two double tuned circuits basically. So, so the main inductance is here, and that's the primary. The secondary is just a small, just a few turns. So it'll do two functions. Essentially, what it will do, it'll provide the right inductance to work against this capacitance to tune the circuit to the frequency we want but also it'll provide via this smaller turning here some uh, impedance matching so we get 50 ohms in and out. So you've got T1, T2 are identical, they're just kind of back to back. And then you've got a small matching capacitor here and this will be simplified a bit in a moment when I, I show you my LT SPICE simulation. And Hans very kindly lays out all the parts you need, so if you go to 15 meters he suggests, uh, well, all of them are 30 picofarad trimmers, 33 picofarad as well in parallel with that, and 3 picofarad as the coupling capacitor. And you wind your um, your inductors on a T37-6. And he suggests three turns to 18. So I put that into LT Spice and simulated it, and let's have a look at that now. So the first thing I did actually is I went to toroids.info and plugged in the, the number of turns to calculate the inductance because I need that for LT Spice. So you can see I've done the first one here, 37-6, 18 turns comes up to 0 0.97. And if I clear that, the other one I wanted was to have three turns on the same kind of toroid, calculate that, and that comes out to 0 0.03 microhenries. And so I'm going to use those two values then to plug into LT Spice. So let's just get rid of this. And here's my LT Spice simulation. Now, in reality, this capacitor here. This one here and this one here will all be trimmers. And I didn't have a 33 picofarad capacitor, so I only had 30. So I used the 30, but three picofarads. Because this one is variable, I knew that that would be fine because I think 
uh, these trimmers go from I think seven to thirty five. I think picofarads from from memory, so I knew that that would be uh, that would be fine. So I plug that in, and if we uh, just take a measurement, then if you're not familiar with LT spice simulations, th this is the simulating a, a, a two volt peak signal coming in, and this resistor doesn't exist in in reality. This is just simulating the 50 ohm load on the end, which you need. So if I do that, and we don't need to. Uh, see the phase. Uh, we see that. So that's what LT Spice predicts we will get and so we're going to build it now according to this LT Spice schematic and, um, and see how we get on. So anyway that's enough faffing around on the computer. Let's get into the, uh, into the garage, to the bench, fire up the iron and let's do some building. Well welcome to the bench and uh, this is where all the magic happens um, hopefully not too much magic smoke though we like to uh, <laughs> keep that where it belongs inside um, and here is a printout of that schematic and uh, you'll see I've just um, altered uh, these uh, capacitors to indicate that those three are actually all trimmers um, but other than that it's just the same as you saw on the computer screen so that's what I'm going to be building for 15 metres. Clearly it's going to have some extra circuitry on either end for the, uh, for the switching, but we'll worry about that later. Um, okay, so what do we need? Well, let's have a look at the components. So I've gathered the components that I need. There aren't all that many, actually. Um, so uh, here we go. Yeah. So we've got, first of all, we've got some higher quality uh, trimmers. Uh, these are 7 to 35 picofarads, so I had to spend a little bit more money on them, but it's worth it because they, they're the ones that are controlling the two tuned circuits. Now, I, this is a cheaper one. This came in a set, so this is just a little 5 picofarad coupling one, and that's, that's variable, so we, we may not need as much as 5 picofarad, so we'll, we'll see. But that gives me some frequency agility. I can tweak it up and down and tweak the coupling, which is very useful. Um, okay, so moving in a bit, so let me get this to focus, that'll be useful. Marvellous. So this, uh, these are the, um, the, the fixed capacitors. So these are 230 picofarad uh, capacitors. These are NP0s. And again, I did have to spend a little bit of money on these. I've had them for a while now. I've just bought a whole load of them from Mauser, I think, or something. Um, because I wanted a reputable source of these uh, higher quality uh, capacitors. And I always put these into, uh, into filters because um, you really don't want your capacitors changing their capacitance <laughs> when it gets hot or cold or whatever. Um, and then we've got um, the little uh, toroids, so the uh, T37-6s, so two of those. And then these, it, uh, this is just the stuff for the switching. So those are just two um snubber diodes so they're, they're just regular um 1n uh, 4148 diodes and they're going to be strapped across these uh, 5 volt relays just to um uh, combat the back emfs but we can say more about that at another stage so that's all the the stuff so um oh and what am i going to build it on well yes that's a good thing um i usually buy this stuff so this is a uh, hundred uh, by sorry, bad reflection there, but 100 uh, millimeters by 70 uh, single sided uh, copper clad board FR4. Um, and I don't want to build it that big, so I've cut it in half. So there we are, we can see. So let's cut it in half, and then I've just indicated um, that in half as well. So this is 70 by 50 now millimeters, uh, and so I'm gonna have you know one band pass filter there, one there, and the two relays on either side that's the idea i have treated it first and apologies if you watched any of my videos you'll be sick to death of me saying this but if you haven't if this is the first one or whatever uh, then it's important that you know um so um very often when these things come they've got like a thin lacquer on them which actually um is not good for making electrical contacts um and it acts as like an insulator so the best thing to do is to take that off. So the way I do it, I get some very fine 
um, wire wool and just go over it first and then uh, get your good multimeter, or not even a good multimeter, but <laughs> any multimeter that works, that's reliable, and just test your continuity um, so that you've got good continuity over the whole of it, especially in the corners, because those are the bits you tend to miss if you're going over it with the wire wall. And then, um, yeah, and then you're, you're, you're good to go. So the first thing for me to do now is to uh, grab me uh, my toroids, get some enamel copper wire, and uh, and get winding. Right. Okay. Time to get winding. Now people get a bit scared about this. I don't know why because um, it's not that hard, and actually I really like it. Maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> For me, it's where um, science meets art. Really, I think if you've got a nice, uh, nicely wound toroid, especially if there's different coloured you know, toroids as well. They can look really great, really. But anyway, enough of my um, weirdness. Um, so how do we do it? Get yourself, first of all, a length of um, enameled copper wire. So I'm using 28 standard wire gauge enameled copper wire. Essentially, really, you want to use wire that's thick enough to get all your turns on, but not to completely fill the core. You really want to leave a little bit without anything on because you want a bit of difference between the in and the out um, because otherwise you kind of get um, mutual capacitance um, if you're in and out too close. So essentially hold it, feed the wire through. Now the thing to do uh, and to remember is when you, every time that wire passes through that toroid, that counts as a turn, right? So that's a turn, even though I haven't done anything yet. So I'm just going to bend it over then I'm going to draw it back poke the end through you can see and just be careful you don't poke it through on the wrong side of the wire because otherwise you 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 twist it you don't want to twist it just pull it tight okay move it around now let me just show you so now you see that's two turns so the wires come through here once it's come round again twice and that's two turns. So let's do number three. And if you put in a few turns on, what I tend to do is pull it around like that and then just with your thumb, move them up, right? Move them up nice and tight. You can always space them out again uh, by putting your fingernail in, You're probably hard to see. So you can push them up or you can space them out, you see, like that. Um, let's do number four. Like that. I try and keep them evenly spaced, but you can, you know, you can faff around with that when you when you've finished when you've done it. Now I'm not going to take take you through every one because that would be very dull indeed. So we've got four turns on here now. The schematic, well, my schematic calls for eighteen, but that where that eighteen comes from um uh, it, well it comes from han summers um uh, and uh, so he determined 18 uh, turns um and uh, so that's what we're going to try first um 18 turns um to 3 and see how we get on right okay well i've wound the the uh, the primary winding on both of my toroids now, actually, what I've done is I've put on 17. Now, the, the reason for this is because what I did is I took Hans's 18 turns. Uh, and when I was doing the uh, the LT Spice schematic, you can't put turns in. You have to just put a value of inductance in. So I used uh, toroids.info to... Um, to calculate the value of inductance that you know 18 turns would give you and it, it came out with 0.97 microhenries and the simulation that i showed you is based not on 18 turns it's based on that figure of 0.97 microhenries now i've measured these and i think 18 turns is too many so i've gone for 17 i'll show you how i measure them in a minute but First of all, you can probably see on the ends there, what I've done is I've got a sharp Stanley knife and scraped off all the enamel off the end of both of the ends of, of the wire. And then you get a hot soldering iron and a nice big blob of solder on it and just hold that and go up and down 
that, that bit that you've scraped. And that will do two things. One, the heat will burn off any of the enamel that you missed when you were scraping. And secondly, it will tin your wire, which would, would, will mean that it will you know, solder on your board a lot more effectively and easily. So that's it. So now how did I test them? Well, I use one of these things, um, which is worth its weight in gold. This is a, a, a Peak uh, LCR 45. And unlike some LCR meters, it will measure down into the picofarad range and, and measure down into very low uh, amounts of microhenries in the inductance range. And a lot of the cheaper ones won't do that. So it's, it's uh, really very good. Um, so, uh, so I'll put one on and show you what it looks like. Right, okay, so we've got um, one of those uh, toroids is connected up. Let's just uh, fire up the meter. And I'll zoom in now on the screen so you can see what's going on. And hopefully you can see. So we're measuring about one microhenry. So that's ideal. We were shooting for about 0.97, but uh, yeah, and it's just under. So that, that's about as good as it's, it's going to get. Um, and obviously we've got some variability and we've got some variability in the in the coil you can squish the turnings together a bit more if you need more space them out a bit more if you need less and that's pretty much what i did to, to get those values so that's with 17 uh, turns and that hopefully won't upset the uh the impedance transformation ratio too much uh, just that one turn off there um uh, but we shall see um so uh, so that's that Okay, progress report. Well, I've finished the uh, the transformers now, so I've put the secondary winding on, and uh, similarly, um, what I did as it's only uh, three turns, I spaced those three turns out pretty widely uh, on there. I scraped in the ends as usual i also connected the two ground wires together and that's actually where i started the uh, the secondary winding at the ground end same phasing as the um as the primary so in other words you know don't don't have your secondary going in where the the primary is coming out keep keep the keep them the same um and um yeah so done those i you see i've chopped them down i've got them um are geared up to go on the board. Now there's another pad going to come on here. You can see I've drawn round some shapes on the board where the uh, relays are going to sit on both sides. And then um, these transformers are going to sit um, a bit like that and that's going to connect over to there. Um, and then the other things are going to hang off uh, those pads and I've just got one more pad to do on the end. Um, so you can kind of see how it's um, coming together. Um, I faffed around trying to get the uh, levels of, of um, uh, inductance as close as I can. Um, but, you know, you could just take Hans's advice and <laughs> it would probably work for absolutely fine. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's all good fun. Right, so I'll get these on the board and, um, and show you then uh, what it looks like. Well, I'm pleased to say it's done. Um, apart from the, uh, the, the switching, of course, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, in another video. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, got the transformers on okay. Only used four pads, four of those little um, uh, me squares, they're called. Uh, you break them off and super glue them down so they're pretty easy. Um, and uh, tried to keep it as symmetrical as I could and keep all these um, um, uh, trimmer capacitors uh, in the in the middle because uh, the two the two at the top will be controlling the two separate tuned circuits and that will control the frequency range um, and, and positioning of the filter. And then the little blue trimmer 
um, will uh, just help the shape of the filter to, to be better as well. And that will affect as well the, um, the insertion loss. So um, yeah, so it's come together. Now, <laughs> never say never. I did a video a while back called The Dark Art of the Bandpass Filter where I go into all this stuff again. Um, and it is a bit of a dark art. And it, just because you've switched the soldering iron off, as I have now, doesn't mean to say it will be switched on again. I'm hoping that most of the adjustments now I'll be able to do with the screwdriver and those trimmers. But occasionally, you know, you do, you, you have to go back and take windings off, put windings on, you know, if, you've, if you're really a bit out of kilter. Um, but I'm hoping we're in the right kind of ballpark figure. And, um, and so the next thing will be to um, uh, get it on the, uh, on the, 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 the bench in the shack and uh, put it on the spectrum analyzer and see what it looks like. Okay, so this is the setup. So I've got my spectrum analyzer there, you can see, and I've got it connected up the in and the out, and I just soldered on some temporary little SMA patch cables. Um, I just got a conventional one, cut it in half and stripped the wires on the ends, and um, they're useful. So I soldered them in and out all the time uh, when I'm testing different modules. So that's that's what we've got. Um, and in a moment, um, I will uh, switch it on. And you're going to see two different things. You're going to see um, uh, camera uh, shots, uh, or, or, or video, I should say, of, of me actually tweaking the filter. But also, you'll see on screen um, a, a real-time video at the same time of what's happening on the Spectrum Analyzer screen because um, this flashy Siglent Spectrum Analyzer has got its own web server in it so I can actually uh, pull up a browser on my computer and you can actually see uh, what's happening um, on, the, on the screen um, as as it's happening on the screen of the uh, spectrum analyzer, so um, you, you'll be able to see the tweaks that I make and the difference that that makes to the shape of the filter. Right. Okay. Well, when you finally connect up your bandpass filter um, to uh, whatever you're looking at it on, uh, and I'll tell you about some other options. But at the moment, I've got mine uh, rigged up to my spectrum analyzer. And um, you might see on your screen something looking like that. Now, that is the, the famous uh, Twin Peaks. Um, and that says, uh, speaks of an overcoupled filter. So that means that um, instantly you've got too much capacitance linking those two tuned circuits. It also says um, that you haven't got those uh, two tuned circuits aligned properly either because as you can see you've got two peaks on the screen so that's where the the, the left hand tuned circuit and the right hand tuned circuit are, are you know they're too far apart um, so what do you do about it well you have to tweak so um, you get your screwdriver and um, now I'm just gonna hopefully you can just see I'm do this with my left hand which is not very really easy but if you move now can you see now what's happening those peaks are moving together and you can take and look at the insertion losses going down as well uh, and you can take it right up and then it spreads out a bit if you take more and then it starts to go back and it goes down the insertion loss again so th there's a sweet spot now of course um you can do the other one as well oh sorry wrong hand um which will do the same for the other one so you can move it along and and essentially what you're doing is trying to uh to get the thing so that it's in the right place and as high as you can get so i've got a uh, the tracking generator set to uh minus 20 um dbm uh, which is good now you can see i've got this here i'm just doing this here and it's a fiddly process and you can spend a few days of your life doing this now at some stage you're going to want to twiddle with this coupling capacitor now 
these are far more sensitive and as soon as my metal screwdriver goes in here it's going to go haywire but bear with it um as soon as i take it out i'll be all right again and what you can do is just adjust the amount of capacitance that you've got linking those two together and now can you see that that twin peak now is starting to flatten out a bit so and you try it and if you go a bit too far well you just correct yourself okay now and the frequencies move forward a bit so I need to try and filter to be. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just have a look at the marker now and see where we are. So um, yeah, oops, 20 point 6 21.3 point 4 yeah still a little bit too narrow but what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in uh, now so we can see a bit better so let's put the span to 20 megahertz let's see what we're doing a bit more um yeah so i mean actually that's that's not bad at all in fact um so especially if we could move it up a little bit because the 15 meter band starts about here yeah so we could if we could move it up if just move the whole shape up in frequency just a tad that'd be just about perfect uh, wrong way okay now let's have a look at that so now we've got so that's the beginning oh sorry i'm have to keep room to press mark or any person on thing so that's the beginning of the 15 that's so 21 megahertz there and that looks flat as a pancake all the way along 24 5 25 yeah so that's the end of it and that looks pretty good um let's go in a bit more um so span let's take it down to 10 megahertz now look at that now full disclosure um i had to play around with this first as soon as i built it um before i started doing videos about it and i didn't get it as close in then as uh, as i have now i mean that that's the beginning of the band um so look at uh top right hand corner uh minus 20.84 so we're putting a minus 20 dBm signal in, so that's that's less than one dB insertion loss. And in truth, I've got some um, SMA to BNC connectors on both ends here, so there's probably a bit of loss in there. So you're probably looking exceptionally low loss, um, which is is superb. Um, and if we go there, look at that, it's flat as a pancake. This is this is a good one, folks. They're not always quite as um, as good as this. Um, and that's completely flat, and that's it. So we're 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 out of the uh, the fifteen meter band there. And I'm just going to zoom out now, so you can see um, what it looks like um, from a distance, as it were. So let's put it back to forty. Yeah, look at that. Absolutely great, and um, uh, I think that will serve me um, very well. So that's uh, that's how you do it. And what do you do if you've not got a flashy spectrum analyzer well you do something else so um what i'm going to use now is a nano vna so let's just um set this down so i can see it okay and um so you can see here that the nano vna is telling me exactly the same 
as uh, as we saw on the spectrum analyzer, which is great. Um, but one great thing we can do on the nano VNA is, of course, we can check the uh, the impedance to make sure we've got a good impedance match and that those transformers are doing their job. But incidentally, just note to uh, yeah, minus 0 0.68 dB insertion loss, this is saying, which is very good indeed. Uh, set at 21 megahertz, that's right at the beginning um, of the band. So I'm just going to come around here now, and we're going to go uh, channel uh, 0 reflect um, format SWR. Okay, so that's the SWR. So um, you can see there, that's really very good. So at right at the beginning of the band, uh, 21 megahertz, we've got an SBR of 1.12, 1 1.17, 1 1 307, 1.27, and that's right at the end, is it 1.4? So yeah, very good, very good SWR. Can't complain about that um, at all. And if we then just switch to having a look at the Smith, there we are, 47.5 ohms. So, you know, you can't um, can't complain about that. Um, so, yeah, um, so that's that's done essentially the same test um, on two different um, pieces of equipment and then an impedance test. And, and because we've been able to do the two tests on the Nano VNA, if um, you're on a limited budget, um, I would pull them for this every day of the week um, because it's such a great uh, bit of um, equipment and it's not going to break the bank. You can do other things of course. Um, I've used uh, an SDR play with um, uh, I made a little wideband noise source and used that and there's some free software you can use your SDR play RSB1 and, um, and turn that into a kind of rudimentary spectrum analyzer. You can do that as well. And uh, so, there's, yeah, use what you've got, you know, but, um, but but there's different ways. And these days, at least, you don't have to, um, you know, blow a whole load of money to get um, uh, some some reasonable test gear um, that's, that's going to help you out. Certainly good enough for our purposes. Um, so there it is. And the final thing I wanted to show you was just this. So this is the actual measurement of the bandpass filter on the Siglent Spectrum Analyzer compared with my LT Spy simulation down the bottom. And uh, although they're set to slightly different frequencies, I think you'll agree <laughs> it's a fair old match really, which one testifies to how good a tool LT Spice is, I think, at, uh, at actually kind of modelling this stuff. And to the, the quality of Hans Summers' design as well, that what I was able to build matches up very closely to what the kind of perfect model predicts. So all in all, that's a good filter. Well, there we go. So I hope you found something of, of interest there. As I said, uh, next video, we'll tackle the whole uh, uh, subject of the switching and I'll, let, I'll explain you know, how that works and, uh, and the rest of it. It's really quite simple, um, but it's quite interesting. Um, just to quote uh, Charlie Morris, I am not an expert <laughs> in any of this stuff. Um, please feel free to, to, to comment or ask questions and I'll do my best to answer them. But if, if I can't, I will direct you to someone with a bigger brain than me. <laughs> and there's, there's plenty of people out there um, that fall into that category. Um, I'm just someone who is fascinated with this stuff and really want to encourage you to, to give it a go. And so um, I, I hope I've done that. Um, Thank you ever so much for watching. I will catch you again on the next video, but until then, take care. 73, bye-bye. <laughs>